Hello there. Um, I am the Trap Witch. Um, I am here with Keelani Nelson, and I wanted to bring her on to my channel just because I wanted to start touching on topics that are near and dear to my heart and that as women we really, really need to start talking about. Um, I recently had a session with Keelani that was wonderful and beautiful, and she's one of those people that I knew I met for a reason. And I say this because Sometimes in life, we don't know why we meet other people that are only there for a season or day or not even longer than a month in our lives. But she's definitely one of these people that I had a brush with someone else very similar to her. And now having her on, I can, I can really have insight on the importance of why we need to talk about these issues, why we need to get it out in the forefront, and why it's so important for us to do so, so that as sisters, we can support each other, uplift each other, and no one has to suffer in silence. So um, I'm going to hand it over to her. I'm going to go ahead and allow her to introduce herself and just tell, um, just tell us a little bit about herself so we can get a picture of where we can begin it and how we're going to go about discussing this topic that's really at times hard to talk about. Okay, how you doing? I am Kilani. Um, I'm Kilani Nelson. Uh, you can call me Key. Uh, basically, I feel I am an example of um, tragedy and triumph coming together. Um, I'm still alive. I, all my life, I have had struggles because you know it's hard-headed or young-minded or just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I do know that I do have a um, a big heart, and um, unfortunately, that was that was also uh, how my tragedy began because of my heart. Um, growing up, you know, I was kind-hearted, and I felt everybody should be loved. And um, you know, it's just I feel like I lead first with my heart, and that that in itself hurt me a lot as well. And so, uh, my introduction to feeling, uh, my introduction to love. Um, it came in a form of, you know, having, having to run away from home because it was confused love, you know, it's a, a lot of different forms of love, but I was seeking it and I, I went after it and I found it in all the craziest wrong places. Um, I found it in the right places too. And that in itself is, is the bright part about the story. Um, would you like me to share any time frame? Does it matter? Beginning in? Um, let's let's start at the beginning, and I want to touch on she was talk, you're talking about you know your heart, and as women, that oftentimes our strength, but also our weakness. And love is something as women we it's instilled in us because we are creators and we're nurturers. We're born to create life, and we're born to nurture that. So so often we give that so willingly in the wrong places at times because mm -hmm. I think we search for that back. And as people who, um, just as women, we give it so much more than we get back. And yeah. it's, 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 it's hard for us to even give it to ourselves. And that's something that I feel like a part of your story really has to touch on because as women, sometimes we wouldn't get ourselves into these situations if we really had that love for ourselves in the first place, which is why it's so important for us as women to start building the home based on love that we want to see in the world. Right, right. which is why, why I came to you is because I'm so full of love that, you know, there's, there's, there's a different type of love out there too. And that's what I experienced. Um, I experienced looking for love in my lower self by using my body, by using, you know, other ways instead of my mind. I actually have an immaculate mind, I believe. And some, some don't like that. They don't like you to use your mind. They like you just to, you know, to be manipulated and, and hush. And, and so that was the wrong kind of love for me. I was, I was in a very abusive uh, relationship, marriage, and it, it seemed to be redundant for me. Um, I ran away from home at a very early age. I was 15. And at that time, I was looking for, for love in anything. Women, men, uh, it didn't matter. I just wanted a companion, really. Why did, why did you run away from home? Um, I ran away from home because at that time, I, um, I was a young teen. <laughs> so I, uh, in, my, in my household, was very strict. My mother was very strict. And uh, me and her had a, 
we had a back and forth relationship. Um, I was looking for my father at that time, my biological father. You know, I was looking for some companionship. I, I was confused. Um, I actually was liking uh, young ladies at that time. And my mother, she looked upon me as a whore. You know, you're abomination, you're bad, you know, you, you know, you can't have that here. And so um, I just yeah, felt really just left out. I feel like a, you know, outcast and not loved and I didn't fit in that household. So she, was uh, very, she had a very religious, strict upbringing. Uh, yeah, uh, my, my family's actually a church family, grew up in a church. Um, I mean, a lot of us, you know, I'm the trap witch. Um, a lot of us struggle with that. Um, not having a sense of belonging when we just know the faith that we're born into or the way that God is portrayed to us, not for us. Right. Right. And, and, and I rebelled against that at that time I was actually rebelling against all of that. Um, I was searching really for the truth because, um, you know, in adolescence you're, you're always on trial. Like <laughs> where you been, where you going, who are you talking to and why are you doing that? And so, they just led me to, okay, let me go to the Bible and see why is, why is it wrong? You know, why is it a sin to, to love this way, to love anyone? Um, like I said, I, I grew up very naive. Uh, it just came to me to, to want to be a companion to everyone, whether it be women or men. And so it wasn't accepted. Um, I wasn't accepted. I was writing poetry. I was expressing myself. You know, I, I was rebelling against what was typical, like just fall in line. And um, so I left. Um, I left. Um, it, it sent me on a. It sent me down a, a, a path that you know. I, today, here I am finding myself. You know, ten years, fifteen years later, I'm still searching for that little girl that I, I ran away from, or I left there. And you know, so that that in itself is what I want to express to the world, to other women like myself. Like, come come home, and and, and home is here where the heart is, and. It, it, it will get you in trouble, but it'll get you out of trouble as well. So that's, that's, that's my life lesson, really. Where did you run to immediately after you left home? What was, what was the next phase of running away from home? The next phase was I'm going to find my, my biological father and I'm going to connect with him. Um, I had some friends. Some, they were in the, the lesbian community, and they took me in, a uh, safe haven. So I, basically I ran to the streets, really. And um, tried to make a relationship with my father, my biological father. Uh, ran to him, and he sent me right back home. <laughs> uh, you know, but I, d I got to connect with him a little bit. But I saw what I was looking for. And I saw what, what my mother was looking at sometimes when she looked at me. And what I would be looking at in the mirror, and I just didn't understand. You know, it was, I was self-destructive because of that. Because I didn't know. I didn't love myself. That's what it is. I didn't love my, myself because I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I came from, really. So a lot of times I tell people, because um, I've been, in, I've had friends or I've been, come across women who sometimes become so hardened to the world, you know, they don't believe in a real kind of love. And oftentimes they don't feel like they're deserving yeah, of a real love. They've never been taught what it is. And I remember one time telling a friend, no, you deserve to have a man that's going to love you the way that your father should have loved your mother. And you deserve to have a man who's going to have, be a father to your children the way that your father should have loved you. Right. Absolutely. I agree. And I, I, naturally, I, I searched for that. I had a stepfather, and I can count on one hand, maybe once or twice, he's called me his daughter and, 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 and said, I love you. You know, that I searched for that. And I said, okay, I'm, I searched all my life for my, my biological father. And every time my mother would look at me and say, oh, you're just like him. I was like, well, who is this person? <laughs> I, I must meet him because, I, you know, he has to have, he had a, an effect on you and I don't even know him. And so I searched for him looking for myself, really. It's because, you know, it, I felt like my masculine energy was coming up at that time. And as a teenager, um, I didn't know what to do with it. And uh, there was other, you. say again. We're looking for that person to protect you because a lot of women, when we don't have male figures in our life, you know, I lost my father along, uh, at an early age. And a lot of times when we don't have a masculine figure in our lives, we develop that within ourselves. Right. Because we don't know what it is to actually be a man. We might develop extreme cases of trying to protect ourselves in our masculine energy, whether it be 
ego, whether it be super defensive, whether it be, you know, anger. It's just a lot of these things yeah. that are healthy versions of what masculine energy is, which is honor, integrity, and being a protector. Absolutely. And I was in the JROTC, you know what that is? The uh, little army corps in high school. I was in that. And I made it to, you know, battalion commander. And, and you know, that was, that was a big deal to me. And that led me to the military. So after I ran away, you know, it was still shaking between me and my mother. But um, I, I just carried on. Like, I'm going to go ahead and go into the military as soon as I can. Because why not? You know, um, I, can, I, I can protect myself. It, and it's just though, that period of I ran away. I took care of myself. I met the man. He, you know, he didn't, he didn't meet what he didn't satisfy my expectations. So I kept going with it. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go all the way to war with it. And, um, I took her with me, you know, <laughs> I drug her around with me and I felt inside that was my mother that I was defeating, but it was really myself. Um, I went straight to Iraq, you know, and, and it, it was ironic because I was like, I'm really scared now. <laughs> I, was like, I can't believe I got myself here. Because I, I ran that far. I ran as far as I could to get away as far as I could. And um, I, I remember being in the desert and I was just like, this is, <laughs> this is the craziest situation to ever be in. And um, I just wanted my mother. That's it. And so for you, like with, with, with you saying that, you know, you just wanted your mom, okay? So for you as a woman now in a male-dominated hmm. organization, Right. How did that make you feel being across the world and feeling like you just wanted your mom surrounded by all this excessive male energy that you felt like you needed in your life and then feeling like, oh, my God, what did I do? And, and that's what I did. I said that. I said, oh, my God, what did I do? And it, literally at that split second, um, you know, everything hit the fan. Like, what happened? <laughs> The base was, you know, ambushed. We had gas everywhere. Um, I, um, I ended up having to have my um, part of my ovary and my appendix taken out in the desert. So it was a lot of stuff happening to me at once. And um, I felt that same energy that I had when I was in high school, that, that when, when I ran away from home and I had to protect myself and figure out which way to go. Um, being chased by dogs and having to, you know, having to run and fly, really, to save myself from being, you know, being ate alive, that kicked in when I was in the desert. And um, that's when I realized that it's me. That is, I, I, it's me. And, and when you literally just said, you know, you had to have part of your ovary removed in the desert, right? One of the main things that makes you a woman, having these things, uh, you- had to lose in the midst of trying to be that masculine energy you wanted for your life and you're still reminded you're a woman i'm a woman and and, I, and that brought me right back to my mother i had to make an emergency phone call you know to, uh, through red cross to my grandmother you know and, and and told her that i was going through emergency surgery on the sand <laughs> on the burning sand uh in, in the middle of war and um she just told me that it's okay she said, it's okay. And I remember hearing her say, her voice says, it's okay. And she sounded like my mother. She sounded like my biological mother. And I, I connected with my mother and I told her, I said, I'm here in Iraq. Cause mind you, my mother hasn't talked to me, you know, since I left. And um, I just felt wrong at that time. I felt wrong for everything. And I, I remember saying, saying, you know, I, I want to, I, you know, I just don't want to, I want to get up from here. I don't want to get up from here because I, I shouldn't, you know, I don't deserve to. But um, I remember that moment that this, I'm a soldier. And so that's when I took on, like, I, I, I'm going to use all this to fight, not just for myself, but for humanity, for those little ch the children that are out here that don't have no family anymore. You know, they, they didn't run away. Their family was taken from them. So all that energy came into me. You know, I, I saw on the, on the, on the, the ultrasound, what they were taking out of me. And I felt like, this is right. This is right. I'm, I'm purging right now. And, um, you know, I went back to the front line. But after that, I had to be evacuated as well. And so um, I always look at that as the time that I, I gave birth to that little girl that, you know, that was hurt, you know. And then she, she came right back, you know, she came right back. 
and I feel like I was at war again. <laughs> and it's constant battle, I feel, in the United States military as well outside of the military. Um, inside the military, they, they, men don't want to hear women who are empowered. That empowered me that moment to be able to survive, you know, war, the desert, uh, surgery, uh, still have an ovary, so it's, you know, still have ability to have children now. They didn't want to hear that. And I was so humble still that I was young. You know, I was 19 years old after I came back. I, I went in 18. You know, I, came, I came from the desert um, at 19. My birthday was in the desert. And when I came back, I, I felt empowered. I felt so strong. And one by one, um, they knocked my confidence down. You know, um, they knocked my confidence down. I was actually uh, uh, assaulted, harassed. Um, I ended up having my firstborn child. Um, I went through it all after after the desert. Uh, I felt like I had to. I had to. I had to keep fighting because I I wouldn't save myself, and um, I had to get her out of there. Um, ended up being sexually assaulted by my flight chief, uh, and that's what I was like. That's it. I'm not gonna fight anymore. And um, ended up um, being rewarded at this point. I had a medical discharge from what happened to me in the desert. Uh, they had to actually reconstruct my whole GI system. I had from my esophagus, my stomach, um, uh, to my colon. Everything has been reconstructed. I have five operations. And that, plus the sexual assault, um, a lawsuit against them, um, against the Air Force, is what got me out. And um, here I am today, you know, <laughs> free, free of that. But I want to give back. I want to be able to t talk to those women who are still in the military, who are still dealing with this, because it's, it's abundant. If, if you don't speak up or if, if, if you try to speak up, they'll send you to the desert and then take your ovaries from you. <laughs> they'll, they'll take you, take your womanhood from you. And so I, I really, you know, you have helped me so much um, these last few weeks just to, you know, get up from here and, um, and keep fighting. But the right way, not of against myself, but, uh, you know, and preserve my energy and be able to do something be effective really and that's what because I, want. I do feel you know women we are built so tough some of the things that we endure the way we are so resilient from it some men never come back from the things that we've had to go through and you speaking on this um experience in the military i mean i've dealt with a few veterans when especially when i was in the sex industry who are living on disability or who have ptsd or even even guys who will seem functional to the everyday world but when you see how they are suffering right in silence right. via alcoholism via um excessive sex Via yeah. lock, lock, locking themselves away and not wanting to be around the outside world because they can't cope because the PTSD is so bad and yeah. the trigger. So I had a right. um, I had a guy I was dating and he was fresh out of the military and I remember sleeping in the bed with him and he would have night tremors and I'd go to put my hand on him and he'd throw my hand. Off. It was so traumatic yeah. in the fact that you have survived what you did and you're not allowing it to affect your spirit and break your spirit because dealing with that guy a lot of that stuff broke his spirit and he told me at one point he's like i'm just ready to die the way he right. lived his life he was just he was a walking zombie right I tell people you know it's it's okay to process the emotions the hurt the pain the anger all of these things, it's okay right. to feel them, but you need to heal yourself away from them because you can't right. constantly relive the PTSD of being at war. Like for you, right. not being at war anymore, you have to let it go. If you, have, if you have a chance to live another day in this existence, another day to heal yourself, then why not? And you know, that's the thing. Um, the military is sold as something that's supposed to be so empowering. And, you know, it, every movie that I've seen about women in the military, it's never empowering to me. No. So just, 
like what was it, GI Jane? They broke her too. That's the deal. Um, you so know they like, show that. They show that in boot camp. Do they? Yeah, yeah. It's um, uh, it's a breaking. It's definitely a breaking of spirit that we have to go through as women. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I wanted to make that point. They do show that. that. That even questions to me, right? How do I even put this? I think we try to build warriors and soldiers the wrong way. Yeah. What, what the military does often at times is break someone's spirit and break their resistance so that they become robotic, just like the machines, machines. that drive the weapons that they fire. And that's really not oftentimes what a true warrior spirit is. That's um, correct. I agree. And, and, and I think as women, that's what we have to really, like really instill, even in our men, you know, us speaking up as women, we got to let men know this as well. As much as I love women, I'm here to save our brothers too, because it starts with us. And we have to let people know sometimes it's better to take the time to, as a soldier to go around something than to go through something because if you got to right. go through it, sometimes there's too much destruction when you have to preserve what you still need. And that's what we forget that war is supposed to be about preservation. We forget so much that it's about preservation and saving something for peace, for the sake of peace, that we end up destroying everything and then there's nothing left. There's no life left. Right, right. And, and, and I realize that, you know, it's not terrible that people acquire these skills in things such as the military, but when they come back from war, it's hard for them to take what these destructive forces that they've learned and put it yeah. towards something to create a new life for themselves. Absolutely. And that's and, what, that's what you helped me with. That's what you told me. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's, you know, so for you, you know, I'm sorry, you really had to endure that. And I feel like, you know, that's the thing, um, especially when it comes to being a strong woman. Men say a lot of times, too, that they want strong women. And then when they get us, right. if we make them feel inferior, if we make them feel less than, the only thing that they try to do is to make themselves feel better is break our spirit. Right. And, and that's what I experienced. That's mm -hmm. right away. It's the go-to for them. It's like, oh, that it's a mission for them to break that spirit. And it's like, you can see it in their eyes, like the reflection, the fire, the reflection is in their eyes right away. And then it, it, it's just like un the unraveling of it all. It's like, okay, now how can I break her? Yeah, and instead of submitting to you and, and making a fair energetic exchange, they prefer to break you. And right. when you broke, when, they, when you and them could have benefited from that, you know, even in the military, instead of breaking women, boost us up. We, you know, I watched this really wonderful documentary um, about Gaddafi, right? Oh, yeah. I don't know, if you know that he had all female, mainly all female bodyguards. Right. Because he right. felt like a woman is built with a sixth sense intuition that men don't have. And most of his, you know, he actually provides military training for all women, or he did in, in the country, regardless if they wanted to serve or not, so that they could have a free education to be whatever they wanted. Now, after I did watch the documentary, there were questionable things that I saw online talking about, well, he had women in his military kidnap other women and make them sex slaves. I don't know about that, but all I know is, mm. all, I do, all I do know is I really respected the system that he tried to put in place to empower women. Right. And I think that if a lot of us got back to that matriarchal system, which it is rising right, right now, where we lift women up and we can in turn lift men up, then things would be so much better. Because if you think about most countries that have women rulers, there's a lot less war. Right. Absolutely. We're more, we're more um, sensible. We don't have to prove our, you know, Guns. Men often have to fight their problems out. Nope. We can hold a grudge for like 50 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> but we'll plot That's nobody. <laughs> 50 years to make the best plan possible before we execute, you know? Um, but like not to get off topic. So what happened um, as far as, you know, after 
these things in the military? Like what, what from there? Oh my goodness. From there, I just spiraled, spiraled out of control. It's, um, for, I feel what happened is I was empowered and I showed off with it. You know, um, I was, to me, I was a diva. Like nothing could stop me. I'm like, look, I didn't been through war. Don't mm -hmm. say anything to me. I'm a man eater. And so the karma gets kind of caught up with me. But ironically, um, my grandmother um, passed when I was in, she passed over when I was in the military. But when it was time for me to get released from the military, me and my son, um, at this time of first born, I, I did receive an honorable discharge, a medical honorable retirement, but I had to wait on it. I had to literally wait on it almost five years. But at this point, when I got out, my grandfather had already passed, and I didn't know. I, I didn't, I, I had no clue. So I had nowhere to return to. And the other option would be, of course, go home to my mother, but I didn't do that. Um, I went with a friend, a military friend, stayed on a military base, had, you know, lived, living free, you know, on the couch, uh, pretty much was homeless with my child, and I um, ended up in the wrong situation. Um, met uh met a guy uh and meanwhile my son's father is tagging along as well so i'm trying to take care of him and we're not together and i met a you know i met another guy and um he ended up changing my life he ended up getting me pregnant uh getting me on 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 drugs and just changing my whole world he broke me but um i was showing out at this point i was showing out you know uh party and I was just like I'm, I'm just gonna live it up because why not uh been chained up why not live free and he caught me and um he caught me doing that <laughs> and um slowly um started breaking me he was a nice guy but um he was tall you know had a athletic build whatever but he was on he was on drugs and this is what started me you know with cocaine ex exploring with different drugs and getting into that that lifestyle which I had no business now, I'll, I'll say this, um, because you're talking about, you know, you got full of yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't realize with the ego, you know, the ego is often a protector of us so that we don't get broken, right? Right. Or any broken anymore. And a lot of times we spend so much time fueling that side of us that, we feel like we have so much power, but then we allow the power to possess us and we think we have control. Right. And then is one day you're like, shit, I wasn't as in control as I thought. Right. Right. That's what happened. That's what happened. Somebody take the wheel. It's somebody who's riding and they right. ride hard. They whip in. They just like, right. you know, the next thing you know, they spin out of control. And right. it's like, in the split seconds, like what happened? What happened? That's what happened to me. I got, pro I got pregnant the first time with him. Um, I didn't know it for three months. Um, the fast life started catching up with me. You know, um, I was, I was dating, I was dating uh, a rather older married man <laughs> because he was taking care of me and my son as well. And so um, it was two guys, it was a younger guy and an older guy, you know, and I was just like, y'all are going to take care of me because I, I got nothing. And so, um, I got right back into the same lifestyle I got I was I was in before I got in the military. So I, again, I thought I had saved myself, but here I am in the same situation again dealing with it and I ran again and I decided I wasn't going to deal with it. Um but this baby growing inside of me uh at this point I my son was taking away from me from CPS um because his biological father and me both were in a house with that had drugs. And so he, they took him from us. And um, at this point, I was in the bathtub committing suicide. And they took my son from me. Uh, shortly after that, um, I met the guy that, that impregnate, impregnated me with my second born son. And um, at that point, I was just like, you know, I, I don't need anyone. And I just kept walking. You know, I, I just kept, I kept going. I stayed homeless. You know, um, met whoever man was interested in me. You know, the older gentleman had me, you know, running drugs from him and, and running cars. And, you know, it, it, it just it just caught up with me. You know, I kept running, kept running, kept running until I was like, I got to get my son back. And um, I did that. I literally walked. And um, that walking to me changed my life. I had to walk everywhere. Again, I was chased by two dogs this time in my adult life. 
and <laughs> flew, flew, flew this time. And I was like, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm not going to do this again. And um, that's what, when I, I said, you know, I'm going to fight back. I fought back against the, the father and um, I literally ran away from him. He was very abusive. He kidnapped me. He killed my dog, you know, threw, he threw my dog out the car and, you know, he, he beat me a lot. And um, I was still carrying my second, my second born son. And so I, I was able to get away and go back to Dallas, started anew. He followed me there. And um, when he followed me there, he took me, my, my, my first bun, born son, hostage. But prior to that, how he got back to Dallas is I had to give birth to my, to my baby. And um, when I did that, um, my, my son, he ended up passing shortly after I gave birth to him. And um, yeah, he's, um, he didn't make it because of, uh, I was beating, he beat me up so much that he was dying inside of me. And when it was time to give birth, I ended up losing him. Uh, shortly after he, you know, he didn't live very long. So I buried him a few days later and um, he blamed me for that. <laughs> and so um, he came back and when he came back, he, um, you know, I, I didn't have any protection. I didn't have anyone there with me, it was just me and my son. And when he came back, he, he came back with a knife and um, he stabbed me multiple, multiple times. Uh, my son actually couldn't talk very well and he said life. And when he said life, I knew life meant knife. And that's what saved both of us. When I heard him say life, I said, this, this man's going to really kill me this time. And I'm not going to negotiate with him. I'm not going to talk. I'm going to get up from here. And um, I'm going to move. Like, I know how. Like, G.I. Jane, everything kicked in. You know, um, everything. And I said to myself, uh, I'm going to fight. And he said, what? And he said, I said, I'm going to fight you back. And um, I said, you're not going, you know, he said, who's going to go first? You or your, you or him? And I said, neither. I'm going to fight you back. I'm not going to uh, lose today. And I felt like I was facing the devil at that time, but I also felt like I saw myself because I, I chased this man, you know, because I had a child and, and I, you know, I was like, you did this to yourself. But then I was like, no, no more blaming, no more running. I'm going to face off right now. And um, he stabbed me, he stabbed me in my face. He, he, he stabbed me multiple times in my heart, my lungs. He cut my throat. He stabbed me in my throat. He, you know, he, he, I fought back. He stabbed me in my hand here, you know, because this is me blocking. Um, and he stabbed me in my hand. And so he um, stabbed me in my face. And I, I fought. You know, he, stabbed, he was able to stab my son. Um, but I fought back. And when I was on my knees, because at this point I couldn't talk, um, because of course he had cut my throat. I said, uh, a prayer, the only prayer I could think of. It's like, at this point, I know, I, I, um, if I pray, that's all I got left. And so I said, yeah, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I should feel no evil. He said, what do you say? I should fear no evil because I know you're with me. And I screamed it. I said it over and over. I said it over and over. And at that point, something told me, go out the window, <laughs> jumped out the window, he helped me break the window because he went after me. And that's how I rolled out of the, out of the house. I literally ran, uh, really, uh, literally could not walk <laughs> again. The same scenario. I'm back in the desert again, you know, tr trying to walk with my, my ovaries is literally frying to death. And I'm like, this is the same thing again. And I turned over and I saw my son at the door and he was yelling across the street. And after that, I blacked out. He saved my life. Is what I'm saying. My son saved my life multiple times, and it, it, it's my seeds that that I'm that the reason why I'm here. And it put me in a, you know put me in um, a comatose state. <laughs> I woke up and both my parents they're standing over me, bio, biological parents. Everything that I was asking for happened at that very moment um, because I yeah lifted up my hands and I said you know I'm not going to run no more. Uh, it's going I'm going to walk it on out. <laughs> And um, that that saved us. So I feel there's power in in, in whatever struggle we we are, you know whatever tragedy we have is not for no reason you know. But we have to stop stop the cycle. We have to be willing to stop the cycle. And that's what I came to you for. It's like, look, I'm gonna keep reliving this because I, I already won. You know, I already won triumph over that situation. So when you went out the window, you're saying he went out the window with you as well. So did that stop him in that moment? No, you he, were... kept, he kept stabbing me. He stabbed me in my legs and my feet as I was going out the window. So what stopped him? Um, 
nothing stopped him. My, my son yelling across the street um, to get the attention of the people is what stopped him. He went back into the house and he cut both his wrists in, fr in front of my, my son. So, you know, this is, this is something that often really bothers me that a man like that who claims to have so much power would be so cowardly to do that to you right. and then not take, not take the blame for it, but take the easy way out. You're right. so, so tough, but now you want to, you know, and I, I'm still alive. You know, my thing is this too. I know what you went through, but what makes me puzzled at times is how he got to that position. What was, what was, you know, because a lot of these men have inner child problems. Yeah, very and true. So little boys that they're carrying throughout life that are hurt and broken too, just as you were. And the yeah. problem is with many of us people, we get into relationships being these broken little girls with broken little boys and trying right. to play out. And right. we're right. getting the brokenness that we found from our childhood. Right. And so, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like, a year ago, I would have sat here and been like, that fucking coward. Right. But then now me being more spiritually sounds like, damn, what got both of y'all there? And, and that's what it was. That's what we resonated with. It took me years to realize that I was resonating with his pain. I didn't know what led him to me or what caught his eye. I just knew I was a woman who had a vagina. And I was like, you just want to have sex with me? And that's it. And I felt empowered at that moment because nothing else mattered to anyone else. I didn't matter to anyone else unless I was a walking, talking vagina. And so I felt like that's all he knew. But when I started intercoursing with him and getting his pain in my womb, getting, exchanging that energy, I started realizing that, oh my goodness, I am sleeping with the in, inner me, the, inner, the enemy. I'm sleeping with the inside of me in reality. And it, it was disgusting when I started trying to break away from it. It was like, it was like, no, you don't, you, you love me. Now you can't stop loving me. And this fatal attraction thing kept, ha it kept happening, kept happening. Um, that was I'm not going to say my fault, but I put myself there. I asked for it. I asked for protection. I asked for the ultimate protection. I, I asked, I, I made a deal with the devil one night and I said, I do not want, I told God, I said, why did you put me here? Why, did, why do I have to keep feeling this? You know, I'm such an empath. Like, why do I have to keep feeling everyone's pain and plus my pain and be depressed? And I said, God, you know, I'm done with you. And I just made a deal with the devil. And that's what led me to, to where I was at to even meet him because I, I was just previously with his brother, you know? And so I was in a state of just whoever, can you give me companionship right now? Because I don't have anyone. My grandmother is not here. My, my papa is not here. You know, I can't talk to my mother about who I am or what I am or where I've been, you know. Uh, I was ashamed. And shame is what led us there. It, I, in, in court, I found out, uh, I met two other women that he had did this to. Um, before me, he was with a, one, with a girl, his, his ex-girlfriend. He actually beat her up in front of me with a two by four. And that inflicted fear in me. And at that day, he beat me up and put me in the hospital as well. And that day is whenever he kidnapped me from the hospital. Like after I got out, you know, he, he said, get in the car. And um, he kept driving because I had witnessed him beat up another woman. She showed up at court, plus another woman who he had took hostage with her three month old baby to go, he held her at gunpoint. And so all these women, you know, showed up at court because I was like, I'm going to stay alive. Uh, and I'm going to, um, speak up about this because he didn't know I was alive. He did he thought I died in the street. He, the first time him seeing me was in court, uh, with them, with those two women. And that day changed my life. Um, I, I was no longer afraid. I was in witness protection program and I was like, he's going to come back and he's going to get out of prison and, and kill me. Uh, you know, he had been writing me letters. Um, like the scenario you told me with the woman, uh, that's going on right now. Um, I was like, 
it, yeah, maybe maybe I should, you know, try to try to compromise with him so that he doesn't, you know, hurt me so bad because I, you know, I did. I mean, this was the ultimate one. Like I, I, I went through those thoughts, but fortunately, I will say my mother was intercepting with the court system. She was telling him that I was trying to get back with him and I was receiving, you know, I was talking back and forth. I, at that point, I was like, how do you know this? Is this not true? Because I was not talking to him. But she, she intercepted. And when they did that, they put me in a program to where I could not talk to anybody. No one knew where I was at. You know, I, I was there in Atlanta. Um, in this situation, I was just like, why was my mother doing this? Why is she trying to take my child from me? Why is she going against me? Why is she not helping me? But at the end of it all, I, my mother's been there. You know, I'm very thankful. And I, I, I send her flowers every day, literally thanking her, thanking her, thanking her, because I look at it as a negative to a positive. Yeah, she did it to protect you. Yeah. Isn't it, you know, it's crazy because two points I want to touch on with that. Um, I watched an interview with Maya Angelou, who oh. was very similar to that. You know, her, she ran away or she was wanting to leave and her mother told her, go. And she always ended up coming back. And I think she said that her mom wasn't, you know, the greatest of moms. But what she realized what she was doing was real love. It wasn't the love that she thought she wanted, but that was love. Right. And as well as also, you know, do you think you would have communicated with him had she not done that? Yes. I, and I'm saying this honestly. I never said this to her out loud. I feel like that was her connecting with me as my mother because I, I did have fear when whenever because it was a whole year in between trial for me which which leads into the next part next chapter of my life but it was a whole year that I had to wait and so those few those first few months where we were going back and forth and I didn't know what was going to happen I didn't know if he was going to get out I didn't know if they were going to say he's crazy and let him out early I was totally scared and so she her interception I was against it because my son was taken away from me again because of the simple fact she told him that I was going to go back to an abusive household. And this is at this point was, you know, attempted murder on a child. And so I was just like, how is this happening? You know, my mother is going to take my child from me, you know? And so um, it took me a long time to realize that she was trying to help me. At that point, I sent her flowers. I was I went there I, and I made, a, I made amends, you know, I went there to her because I saw at this point, I think that she didn't see like I saw and I'm just waiting, you know, waiting for her because she's the last thing she said to me is that I'm dead to her because deep down inside, she didn't come to my wedding because I, I did get remarried, you know, she just, she's, you know, she doesn't see me now uh, and I feel maybe she does, you know, I, but I still talk to her every since I can in prayer and dream because she's still, you know, she's still alive. Um, it's just I want her to see that I, I had to go through what I had to go through. I literally had to run away from her. Like you said, I had to separate myself in order to heal those things, not just from me, but from her, from my grandmother, on and on and on, because she was hurt too. You know, she left home early as well. She had me early, you know. <laughs> it's, we had the same cycle. And um, when I saw that, I just wanted to connect with her. And I was thankful for him. You know, I, I was able to forgive him in court and – Forgive him, but he was he was he was murdered in prison, and it, it just took a whole year later for um, a whole another year after the trial for me to be released of that, and it, I was just like, oh my goodness, I can exhale, and that that in itself is what changed things. But if I didn't stand up, those so other I, women that got I if wanna, I didn't stand up, you know. Yeah, I want to ask you this because in the situation of the young woman that I had met previously. You know, she is in a situation where you could have been in, where she's communicating with the guy. Oh, you know, and, and this, and you know, when I talked to you and I told you and I said, it's funny how God works because I was supposed to meet you. We're supposed to have this conversation because when I met this girl and she went through the same things that she, you went through, um, you know, he broke her teeth out, tried to gouge her eyes out, poured, poured boiling water on her, broke her ribs, raped her, drugged her, all these things. And she had an opportunity 
to share her story and to save other women. And she still continues to communicate to try to save him. And, I, and, and someone like who's gone through that, someone who's gone through that, and there's other women who go through this and they still choose to side with their abuser and their attacker. Someone who has now survived that, what is your advice for women who are doing that? My advice is see past the fear. You know, it's fear talking. It's, 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 it's him whispering, you know, and it's him inside the womb. That's, that's what I, that's, it's he, you're inside the matrix with him. He, he doesn't belong there. And so that, that I had to actually connect with that and say, get out. You know, I, inter I let you enter. Now I want you to get out. You have to say exit. You have to give them, you know, show them the exit door. You, you can't let them, you, they're no longer welcome. And that in itself, the psychological part is what was playing in my head over and over from when I did have love for him because I didn't love him no more. Like I, at that point I had no love and I was like, why am I even wasting my energy? I have no love on someone who's killed, not just my son, but my spirit, my dog, like my whole life to try to kill me and my, my living son. And so when I thought of my children, that was the last thing. If you have children, you know, if these women have children, um, it's over. Think of them. That's it. That's the only reason for being here. It's your no, it, 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 it's crazy because, you know, I remember speaking with her and, you know, she says, oh, he's going to change. No. He's, he's telling me that he loves me, this and that. And I said to her, I said, girl, he's sitting in prison. All he's got is time. Right. He, he, do you know what he tried to do? He tried to take away your time. He tried to take away your life. Why do you have so much sympathy for someone who had no disregard for your life and I remember being between her and her mother one day because just like you her mother was the one who saved her from that situation her mother found her and she like you also has a son and what was done to her was done in front of her eight I think eight day year old son and as I watched her hold her child, I said, what saved you that day? And I'm very emotional. <laughs> I said, what saved you that day was your mother's love for you. Right. Your mom saved your life. And just yeah. like you, your mom saved your life. Yes, and even though, even though she doesn't, you know, see eye to eye with her mother a lot of times, and you didn't see eye to eye with your love, your mom showed you what real love was. Real love. That's all and I want. Struggle, you know, those things. And, um, it's one of those things I looked at her and said, now it's your turn to teach your son that. Right. Because your mom, can't, your mom has showed you, but now it's not her priority for her to force you to do that. You need to do that for the sake of yourself and right. for the sake of your child. You know, he, he, I told you, you know, your husband, you know, it was her husband that did it to her. Your child's an extension of the love that you guys created, but he had no regard for that when he was trying to take both of y'all's life. No, none. And, and I think sometimes we attach ourselves so much to physical, physicalities of people, like, oh, if they go, I don't have a body to love me. I don't have, and, and we don't realize it, but oh my God, these spiritual entities are toxic. Because to me, I don't even, look at at that time as it necessarily being a, a being it's a, it's a low vibrational entity like you said it was yeah. like staring at the devil yes. and trying to enslave you and to be honest with these people like they're actually enslaved by these entities and they won't fight to break free from them right. and so you know it's just it's really sad to see women who do lose their lives because of it and yeah. You know, I'm not going to say fortunately for you, but in regards to the situation with him, you no longer have to have the anxiety of being fearful and watching your back worrying right. that he's coming after you anymore. Right. And with these women who enable the behavior and still encourage these men by victimizing them instead of themselves, or even freeing, not even victimizing, freeing themselves from the enslavement 
they choose to victimize their abuser instead and have sympathy. And it's like, what, how does that even begin? It's because you know what? I feel it's like because that's the only type of love they've really identified with. And that's all they know. And it's like, well, don't take that love from me. That's all I know as being love. That's it. You know? And you- it's for you. I'm just, I'm so grateful that you're fine. You survived. You got your shit together. You're, you know, you, you're really now a soldier. You're really now what a warrior spirit is. You know, someone whose spirit cannot be broken. That you had to go through all those physical inflicted wounds, but they've healed. You've got, you know, you've got scars to yeah. remind you, but they healed. Absolutely. They're closed now. And what sometimes people do is people relive those wounds over and over instead of healing themselves away from it. And I'm glad that you took that step. And I really want us to let women know that there is and there are safe spaces to get away from this type of behavior, to break free. Because, you know, so many women are losing their life. Um, This young girl who was killed a few days ago in Chicago. Yeah. Because she was in the wrong company with people who really weren't for her, who left her, who didn't care. But oftentimes when we search for love in the wrong places. Right. (laughs) Right. What happens to us? We lose ourselves searching for that acceptance, for that love for that sense of belonging, and then we lose everything. Right. Everything. Everything. And, you know, for you, you had to lose almost everything, but you realized that you have yourself. Yes. And, and that's what we have to get back to instilling in our people. It's like, you have yourself. Yeah. Everything else doesn't matter. Not at all. You do have you, you know, at the end of the day, who are you looking at in the mirror? And I remember not being able to look at myself because I had bandages on myself. And so many times I was like, before this, I had black eyes and, you know, busted lips and um, hair torn out my head, you know. And I was like, I had to look at myself to fix those wounds and then cover myself up. And then when I got to the point where I was like, okay, at some point I have to uncover myself and I'm uncovering myself now. I'm, I'm, it's more and more I uncover, I'm seeing who I am. You know, I didn't ever grow up. You know, I left a young girl and. And you, that makes me think of something, you know, you looked at yourself, but I feel like you saw deeper than what you were seeing in the mirror. Right. And I, problem is with so many people they have no sense of their identity that they keep looking in the mirror to see something that they realize they're never going to see until they feel something here like we said at the beginning home is where the heart is and so in the situation with the young woman that I met you know months ago that went through the same exact things as you you know her her pictures are all over the internet she can google her name and see herself And it's like, how can you look at yourself and what was done to you and say, that's love. Right. And when I met her not too long after her attack, she didn't have one physical wound that I could have tell that she went through that. And I thought that was very, that was deep for me. Because when people meet you, you know, when I had the session with you, I didn't expect to be coming into the session to be talking <laughs> about things that we did because you were so full of light. You don't have any physical wounds that I would be like, oh, my God, she's really went through some things, you know. And that's beautiful. And, you know, there are women who go through things like acid attacks um, that are left disfigured, and they're still – so much warrior spirits and fighters, right. um, regardless of the, the, the physical. And we just really have to 
instill in our people that, you know, building that spiritual stamina is necessary. Um, that's what makes someone a warrior spirit, because at the end of the day, a warrior, a real warrior is just someone who has themselves and they can win the war with that. Yes. Yeah. And we're, at the end of the day, your story is about spiritual warfare. Yeah. Yeah. That that's you within yourself from the day you were born. Yeah. Day one. And day zero. <laughs> and, and this is something that's really like important for me to say as well. And I touched on a post yesterday about it. Many of us don't realize that when we reincarnate, right? Because we reincarnate over and over again until we get it right. 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 And the circumstances we're often born into are meant for us to fight for who we are. Because we come, we come to this plane and we do it over and over again until we figure out why we're here. Right. And we go through karmic cycles of things that are supposed to break us, but, are, but, but we're supposed to use them to elevate us. Right. And that's why I tell people it's so important to fight for who you are as a spiritual being. If you know that the environment you've been born into doesn't sit right with your spirit, you, I tell people as well, because people have a very, um, I think we have a warped perception at times when it comes to our parents. We don't want to disappoint our parents. We don't want to go against what they've been brought up into or whatever, but they, they were the vessels that we were transported through. You know, they, they, they were the, the MARTA or the Metro train or whatever of how we come back reincarnated, but we're our own spiritual beings. So we can't allow our loyalty to become slavery because we feel like we're attached to the environment and, and we're possessions of our family or our friends or things that we've known for so long, but we need to break away from because if it doesn't sit right with your spirit, it's for a reason, because that's not where your spirit is supposed to be at home. Yeah. If your spirit doesn't feel at home there, then you have to look for inside where, where is that, where is that going to feel like home? And I tell people all the time, you see it like with you being around a religious parent, I'm around a religious, you know, Christian mother. And the one thing that, should have broke me when it came to trying to fight for my beliefs, fight for what I've stood up for. I had to possibly sever the relationship with her because I knew what I was doing was right for my spirit. Right. And it, and it ended up making me a better person, our relationship stronger. And I feel like that's something we have to reiterate that you had to go through all of that to find your purpose, to find your voice, to find who you were as a spiritual being. So people have to understand, um, and I like to say this, sometimes we can't look at our struggles as struggles. We have them as the slow success to finding who we are as a spiritual being. So we're slowly succeeding. We're not struggling. We're slowly succeeding and trying to get to I love it. find who we are as a spiritual being. I love that. Yes. Because there's no, mistakes. there's no mistakes. Everything happens for a reason. Everything is a blessing in disguise, and we always have to look for the blessing. And I'm, like, so happy that you found that. And, you know, for you, justice was served. Um, but even in situations where I want to reiterate for men, he didn't have to get himself into that situation. No. That's it's, why it's important for all of us to heal. Yeah. And I feel like he was he was released when when you know, when he was killed in prison, uh murdered in prison. I feel the karma in itself was equal for him. Because he, he was suffering from sickle cell, you know. Uh I found out in court that he had been on meth. Uh these things he was hiding from me and I was chasing him trying to figure out what it is that you're hiding. I came across it, you know, I was like, I knew about cocaine. I didn't know about meth. I was, and I was like, it doesn't make any difference. He was running from something and he was getting the drugs from his mother. She showed up at court, you know, and anytime they would address the fact that his mother was involved on all of his incidents, like when he, he was arrested, she was there, she would object. 
she would eject every time. Even when I would tell her, he's beating me. He, he took my car. Can you pick me up? You know, I need help. And, you know, she, she was not the mother that he needed. He was and, and, and had, he, he, had he fought for himself as a spiritual being to heal himself right. away from that, he might have not been in that position, you know? So regardless of the circumstances, you know, um, peace to his spirit, light to his spirit, um, because it, had, it took him to build you into the woman who you needed to be. Absolutely. And, and I was thankful for his, his existence. So we always, we always have to remember we, we meet people for a reason. Yeah. And so I'm glad I really met you. Um, you're, <laughs> like, working, so you're working on a book? Yes. Um, yes, I am. The, the Walk. Um, it's, it, I have a multi-series of books and lookbooks. Um, I'm doing my son models, but I inspired to be a model. And when this tragedy happened to me, I was taking pictures and I was doing, trying to be a model. And um, I'm back to that, <laughs> wanting to uh, express myself in my book um, and tell my story. The, the happy part about it is I'm with my soulmate, my current husband, who is like my brother lover. Um, I was telling you about that story. <laughs> and so it's, it's, uh, it's like a trilogy. Uh, book it's um from the beginning to the end and then the beginning and the end is the same thing so I, I I'm going back and forth between the name of the book but I, I settled on my walk is what I'm and I, and I like that because recently I was doing a session with a young woman and the oracle card I pulled for her was go outside and walk yeah <laughs> so so often we underestimate walking things off just being in nature and just going for a walk and being one with ourselves, not even having to tune into our thoughts, just being, just yes. being one with outside and just being whole within ourselves for a moment where we're just one. going, going about our business. Um, I really like that. The walk I do. Um, and when you think about it, uh, how often, uh, are sabbaticals described as a walk, like a spiritual path or the walk, you know? Yeah. Um, I really, I recently went to a Hindu temple and there's a story about the teenage yogi and literally after his parents' death, he left home with just a few belongings and went for a walk across India on a sabbatical to find God. And he had to realize God was within him the whole time, but that's all he needed on the journey. And yes. that's what we have to tell people, you know, that's all we need is ourselves on the journey. We have to find God within ourselves. But along the, along the path, we slowly hope to realize that, that it was there all along. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So are you going to be doing any, um, you know, outreach work with young women, domestic violence, things of that oh, sort? Oh yeah. Um, I, I, I wear purple, you know, domestic violence for purple. Um, my, my, my husband actually, um, my current husband actually is in the, in the fight, the struggle, in the triumph, in the success story with me. Um, he, um, his father was murdered and he had trial in the same courtroom that I had trial in for my, for my you know, um, situation, my, my attempted murder. And so um, we have, we have, we do nonprofit, nonprofit work together. And we have a nonprofit organization we piece together. And I do my main ministry, quote unquote, my main uh, target audience is women, um, young women similar to me who are running away from themselves and found themselves in a domestic situation and came out of that a whole new person. And so I, I, I want to be able to do whatever I can. What's the name of your organization? Uh, our organization is called Free to Streets. And it's, it, it, it doesn't necessarily deal with core, just women. It deals with homeless, incarcerated veterans, people who have lost their way, you know, from running away or from being in the gang or from being in the wrong place, at the wrong place at the wrong time. So those who are going through their rehabilitation um, point, I target women. I, I want to, in and outside of the nonprofit, I want to be a vessel, like you said, I want to be an example. I want to be available to any women 
who are currently, you know, in a situation. Period. So how would someone go about contacting you? Um, you can contact us, uh, myself directly. Uh, nine, I have a 972-514-6124 is my phone. It's the phone number. You ask for me, key. And you, or you can email me. Um, our, um, our website is actually, you want the website? I can um, give you that. It's going to be www.freetostreets.org. Free, like F-R-E-E-D-T-H-E, streets, uh, S-T-R-E-E-T-S dot com. And it's pretty much resources. Dot org. Oh, forgive me. Dot org. Dot org. Yeah. And it is set up to, to give resources to those who are in those situations. But me, you have helped me so much to raise my voice and say, look, I need to be available um, to speak to any, any women, young women, um, preferably teenage women who think that, you know, this is the way to go, like running away, getting into the sex industry, because, you know, that happened to me too as a runaway. I just want to be available to all of them throughout the whole process. You're located where in Dallas? We're in Dallas, um, downtown Dallas. The actual address, it's um, the physical address. Um, I, it's 1920, but I don't need to give that to you right now. But we're in, we're in Dallas. So you're we're in Dallas, Texas. That's all they do. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone wants to meet with you in Dallas, um, do outreach, you know, hopefully you can be of service. Uh, go to the website, check you guys out, um, give you a call. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. For your story um it needs to be told um we need to start you know saving women um saving men saving just saving our people in general um by giving them a healing you know freeing the streets healing the streets um one person at a time hopefully um more than one person at a time so that we can be fully functional people that can just move in love and light and be the love and light that we need for the world yes. so thank you so much key for Thank coming you. on and I am grateful for you and let's hope that the story can um, help people out there who are going through similar situations and Absolutely. can know that there's a safe space and there's a safe place for them to start healing. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> Bye.